fortress and my deliverer so my God my strength in whom I will trust my shield and the horn of my salvation my stronghold I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised so shall I be saved from my enemies amen amen to that promise so let us as a church as a family praise the name of the Lord who is worthy to be praised and we shall be saved from our enemies. Amen. Father, we thank you, God, for this beautiful day as we come together to lift your name once again, to sing praises and honor to you from our hearts, surrendering our lives to you, yearning to hear from you, Lord Jesus. Bless this time. Bless the service ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We worship. So oh. 
to save the world you love. And this hope is an echo for my soul. Our God will stand unshakable. Let's sing it one more time, your name. Your name. above all names. You are our strength. You are our fortress in troubled times, Lord. We praise your name and we lift your name, Lord Jesus. For you guard our lives. You save us and you protect us, Lord Jesus. That's why we praise you for who you are, the great I am. Thank you, God.
Right, morning church. Hope you had a great time worshiping God. And this is an amazing time. And as the city opens up, we just pray that wherever you are, you are safe, keep healthy. And we pray that soon we will be able to meet in person. Right, this is for the announcements. And we just want to bring to your notice that we will have the same as we continue. Uh, as last week, this week on the Proverbs class, we will finish Proverbs 3 and begin with Proverbs 4. Okay. On Thursday will be a time of prayer. Saturday will be the ladies Bible study. It's an amazing time happening there. And so keep those events in prayer and times also. And as usual, we will have Sunday service. Now, if things open up, we will meet live here in the hall. But if they don't, then we'll be back online. Okay. And so <clears throat> just have a blessed week. Stay focused. Stay in the word. Stay uh, tuned to God. Pray. And make sure that in some way you can spread a little bit of the gospel. Give a track, pray for someone, intercede, help, whatever is needed. Just give glory to God. Okay, so we look forward for a blessed service ahead. And uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for the worship. And lead us, God, as we move towards the offering and the message that you have a message for us, God. And you have a purpose for our lives, God. So help us. And build us up and encourage us in Jesus' name. Amen. And, uh, this uh, time, this uh, this moment is uh, for the offering. So, so for the offering, uh, let's go to Genesis chapter one. Uh, oh, sorry, Genesis, uh, the first book. <laughs> Uh, the first book of the Bible and uh, just uh, let's go to uh, chapter 4 and verse uh, 1 to 4 we will see uh, some portions from there and uh, ask God to lead us and guide us and bless us and make his uh, offering uh, known more to us so in this uh, portion of scripture uh, probably this is the first recorded uh, offering that we see in the Bible and uh, God just sets the standards there itself about the offering probably first uh, first time man is uh, coming up with something towards god and god is just setting the benchmark over there saying that uh, what is needed of us when we offer it to the lord so uh, in in the portions uh, that we see in genesis 4 verse 1 to 4 it says that uh, Cain and Abel, it's, it's the story of uh, Cain and Abel, where uh, Cain gets uh, his uh, first uh, fruits, he's, he is getting the best of things that he has. And on the other hand, Abel has uh, something to offer to the Lord that is of his, uh, uh, of, his, uh, uh, of his portions that he has, that he, uh, he has from his... Uh, things that he uh, that he, he has earned or he is taking care of so he is offering from those things and um, god god in a way uh, commends abel for his op offering but uh, when it comes towards cain he is uh, just saying that uh, you know you need to understand uh, what is it that uh, i want you to offer and um, god is being uh, I think he is making him understand rather than more of a rebuke it is it's like a teaching that God is showing him and I believe it's not only for Cain that he showed it but it is also for us and uh, God told him that uh, that this is the type of offering that I am looking of okay it's not the matter of things that we are bringing to the Lord but it is the heart and um, the way we are getting those things towards the Lord so God is uh, really not in a way in a sense interested with uh, the things that we are getting but uh, how we are getting he is interested in that um, it says in Psalms 50 verse 8 to 13 that uh, there is nothing in this world that uh, that doesn't uh, that that doesn't belong to me and if I have need of those things uh, it's not that I will ask of you to get me those things, but the Lord, uh, the Lord says that you know, it's uh, it's something that I want you to do. It's something that I have, uh, I have uh, 
I have brought this opportunity towards you and um, when we offer when we give it to the Lord it's uh, it's uh, it's it's definitely the matter of how we are offering and uh, and also the faith that is included in that okay so the offering has to be with the faith that we are giving it and uh, in the same manner Christ also tells the widow uh, who has given like though the portion that she gave to the Lord was very small and it was uh, it was it was very small portion that she gave but Christ commended her Christ said that she has given more more so it's not about how much we are giving but it is how we are giving that's the main thing and we do it by faith and God puts that faith in us God gives us that faith and an offering uh, is something that we need to do by faith we may not understand everything that is going on okay so so the widow uh, in mark 12 41 to 44 it says that uh, she gave everything that she had christ says that she gave everything she has and it's not only that god is commending her uh, uh, the giving of everything she has but also that the fact that she has trust in god and she's trusting God for that so that is the that is the heart behind the offering and God says that to us and as we give as we offer to the Lord let's just pray and hope that God is uh, God is helping us he is increasing our faith and let this offering be a faith offering towards the Lord not of uh, how much or what we can give to the Lord but Lord, I put my trust in you, I have faith in you, and I am giving it towards you. In Hebrews 11, 4, it says that uh, Abel uh, gave it by faith, like, you know, it was his faith through which he gave to the Lord, and, and Lord helped them. And Lord said that, you know, this kind of offering is commendable, this kind of offering is what I am looking for. So, so let's hope. Let's pray and ask the Lord to give us that faith as we offer towards the Lord. And Lord, just increase our faith and, and let this be a faith offering as we give it towards you. In Jesus' name, Amen.
And so <clears throat> we will continue from there and uh, uh, finish this series. So let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning once again uh, and we give you all the glory, all the praise, all the honor. And thank you that we may be jars of clay, but the light that shines through us is the glory of God. That Christ would be revealed through our lives in these days. We commit these times, these moments into your hands. Bless us and help us grow in these moments, Father. We worship you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and we'll begin a little bit from verse 13 onwards and then go forward from there. But before that, <clears throat> uh, for the believer, the moment we receive Christ into our lives as Savior and Lord, our life becomes a source of God's ministry. We are ambassadors for Christ. That's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5. We are ambassadors for Christ. And the life that is now revealed, God's life is revealed through our lives. And that's, Paul is, that's what Paul is saying about that this is a treasure. That though we are jars of clay, now as believers, there is much greater purpose. The moment we believed in Christ, our life is no longer an aimless existence or fatalism, what will be, will be. The life of the believer takes on an eternal purpose now. Each one of us becomes a source of the ministry of Jesus Christ to reveal him to the nations. There is no longer a life that is now lived to satisfy ourselves. This life now belongs to Christ. And this is what the idea is. That through our lives, we would be a blessing to others. Because we are revealing Jesus Christ. That's why God put on the earth the church. The body of Christ. And this is, this, this is something that we need to remember. <clears throat> and I found this somewhere, so I'm repeating this. The church is the only organization in the world which exists entirely for the sake of those who are not its members. Unbelievable, but it's true. The church is the only organization, or I should say organism, which is an organization in the world which exists entirely for the sake of those who are not its members. <clears throat> because the purpose of the Christian and the church is to be a blessing to the nations, is to reveal the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations. Our lives have a purpose. And in verse 13, Paul would say that. He would say that because I have believed, therefore also I speak. What's he saying? He's saying, I've believed in God, in Christ Jesus, and therefore I speak what is biblical. The plan of God. You know, in difficulties we remember, James chapter 1 verse 9, which says, the humble brother glories in his circumstances. That they realize that there is a purpose for their circumstances. It's not that we deny earthly circumstances, that, you know, this is not happening, you know. Like some people will think and go an extreme and they say, no, 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 no. They may be sick, but they say, no, we are not. We are absolutely fine. No, they are doing the biblical thing. We are not denying our earthly circumstances, but we are praising God in those circumstances because he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing possible in Ephesians 1.3. And whatever the outcome happens of the trial, of the affliction, we know as believers, Philippians 4.19, that God will supply all our needs according to the riches in glory in Christ Jesus. God will supply. And this is not finances only. This is every need. 
God is able to supply. Because <clears throat> through what happens in our lives, God is trying to accomplish something in you and me. Maybe it is a strengthening of our faith. Maybe it is that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Maybe it is a transformation of character. Or he may be wanting to use us to be in spiritual influence in someone else's life. And because we have a purpose, God will allow that to happen. But in those circumstances, He will also supply all our needs. And remember this truth always. God knows what you need better than you know it. God knows what you need better than, better than you know it. And when Paul begins to write this and he's in the middle of writing all this, <clears throat> he's probably thinking there are people in this world who are Christians who may be struggling with affliction, with a spiritual battle, with, with you know, comparing what is going on. And Paul is saying, I am going to bring a contrast now that what you are going through right now is very light compared to the weight of glory. That's in verse 18. We'll come to that. Because sometimes the affliction can get heavy, can get stressful, can cause a person to quit. And Paul says, as a Christian, that should not happen. That should not happen because then he begins to say, how do we receive strength for the battle? How do we remain motivated? And a Christian reading these verses sometimes can think, Paul, do you not know what we are going through or what we are facing in our life? Is it so light for you that you call these afflictions light and you know temporary and momentary? But I, it's been going on for a long period of time in my life. And Paul would say, how many of you have gone through 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 28? I speak as if I'm a madman in more labors, in imprisonments, in beaten without times without number, danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews. 39 lashes, beaten with rods, stoned three times, shipwrecked, spent a night in the deep. And he's saying, have a look at my list. He says, have a look at my list. Are any of these things that you are talking or complaining about? And the Holy Spirit would put this down so that we would have a reflection that the man who wrote this is the same man who's saying that we have a momentary light affliction. And Paul is saying it is light. In fact, when I became a believer, my multiplied afflictions began. It was not a single one. Multiplication happened. And very easily I could have avoided them. Very easily I could have made an excuse, but I did not. Why? Because in this jar of clay is the eternal weight of glory. And the treasure that is within us has to shine out. That is the purpose of the believer. That the treasure has to shine out. The gospel has to be revealed through our lives. You remember when you first became a believer? Or at least I remember when I first became a believer and uh, took off the rings, the many ceremonial threads that seemed very important and crucial for me to wear and said, I will not believe in this. There was anger. You know, when there was time to uh, eat food and there was a prayer before food, it was looked upon as like, what's wrong with you? And maybe it has happened to you, maybe it has not. But when you became a believer at the workplace or in a business, you took up a stand and said, no, we are not doing certain things because it's not biblical. What was happening in those moments? Light was shining through. Maybe you are a missionary. Maybe you are in ministry. And maybe there was a time where you said, enough, I am not going to stay average. And by the way, you are a believer today. These are not the days to stay average. Oh, I am satisfied with a few minutes. Or I am not reading the Bible, but I am happy listening to a message or a few songs. These are not our days to stay average. That's not our purpose. Our purpose is that the light is to be revealed. And what happens is the moment a believer, man or a woman, they realize and recognize and have surrendered their lives to Christ and begin to live on the provision of grace, 1 Peter 4.10, 1 
for their lives. <coughs> Everything in that that follows uh, becomes light. Everything is light. No matter what circumstances come, they are light. Everything becomes momentary. Because our focus is on the eternal. Our focus is not on the temporary. That's on the earth. And when Paul talks about it in verse 13, and then he goes on to verse 14 and he says this, Knowing that he who is raised, <coughs> Jesus, the Lord Jesus, will also, will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. These are key words. Raise up the Lord Jesus, raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. What is Paul saying here? This is his confidence. He's saying the one who raised up Jesus. That's the Father, the Holy Spirit and Christ himself raised him up. He says will also raise us up. He's, you know what he's trying to say? Whatever you are under pressure, whatever bothers you, or you think it's an affliction or a trouble or a trial, whatever it may be, he's saying it's going to be worthwhile because Jesus will raise you up. Jesus will raise you up. <clears throat> when an unbeliever looks at a Christian and the Christian is revealing the light of the gospel and revealing Jesus Christ, to the unbeliever it does not make any sense. They, are, they think that these circumstances and these afflictions and these trials and these troubles have come to the Christian, that means something is wrong. They are suffering and yes, they could be. But Paul is saying that they don't understand this. That all these things are for our sakes. They are working for us. And he would say that in the next verse. All things are for your sake. And Christ will raise you up. And Christ will raise you up. And the believer is saying, thank you. Why? Because my life is now revealing the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Sometimes the afflictions, the troubles can be a lot. And there can be pressure. And I am not saying we deny it. We are not denying what we are going through. But we are saying we have the same spirit of faith in verse 13. That we are convinced that Christ will raise us up. He will give us the victory. He has, but we will see his victory too. Listen, there is no defeat in the life of the Christian. There is no defeat in the life of a believer. There is always victory. But he says this one point here, and he will present us with you. Where will he present us? At the Bemer's seat. You and I both will be presented before the Lord Jesus Christ at the Bema seat to give an account of how we lived on the earth. By the way, you don't have to fear the Bema seat because it's not a decision whether you will spend in heaven or in hell. That's the great white throne judgment. And by the way, no believer will be there. But we will be standing before the Lord Jesus Christ at the Bema seat to give an account of how we lived our lives when we were on the earth. There is a day coming where we will meet God face to face, alone, and each one will stand before Him. And Paul is saying we will be presented before Him. That's the day when we get to know our prizes. What is the prize that we will get? And Christ will ask us to give us an account of how we lived our lives. What was your response when you heard the word? You were under a pastor teacher, you were in a church. When you heard the word, what was your response? Did you mix faith with it and live? Or did you were casual in your listening? There is a reward for it. What was the way you lived? Were you gracious? Were you revealing Christ? These are some of the questions that we prepare on this earth here so that we, can, we don't have to hang our head in shame in, before Him. The loss of rewards will bring, in a sense, a little uh, shame to us. We don't want to be standing with our head bowed low before Jesus Christ. Because there is 
gold, silver, precious stones at the Bhima seat in the sense of rewards, but also there is wood, hay and stubble that will be burnt up in smoke. So how did you respond to what you hear? How did you live? Were you kind? Were you gracious? Did you reveal Christ? Were you Christ-like? What was the response to your prayer life? How did you respond in your prayer life? Were you motivated to pray? What was the response of sharing the gospel? Did you share the gospel? You know, like what, what, was, the, what was the quality of the way you lived? Not the quantity. Not how many times, but how did you do it? We will be presented before the Lord. And Paul is saying that we have a believer, have this confidence that when we are living in the way that Christ has called us to, then we have this confidence that God, when we present it before the Lord at the beamer seat, our heads will not hang in shame. Did we pray or did we fail to pray? Did we read the scriptures, study the scriptures, meditate upon the scriptures or we fail to do it? Did we respond in faith to what we heard? When we heard the message on Sunday, did we forget it Monday morning? Or we were seen Sunday night? <laughs> what did we do? How did we respond to it? Did we apply it in our life? Did it become personal? Or it was just something in the air? I am not against listening to messages. Listen to as many messages as you can, but remember this truth. That message becomes good only when you apply it in your life. Just by listening to a message, nothing much will change. It's good. Listen. Your faith will increase. Yes, you can say faith comes by hearing. But then one day the faith has to be put into work also. James chapter 2. Both are needed. And one day we will stand before the Lord. Did the, was the treasure revealed through your lives or no? Were you revealed? Were you like the perfect pot? Or you were like the broken pot, the humble pot, who's, who had flaws, who had mistakes, but out of your life came life and it gave life to the flowers and the seeds on this side of the road and that would be put as a decoration, as an adornment in the master's house. That's the purpose. In verse 15 he says, all things are for your sakes so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Yeah, this is the confidence that the, everything is working for us. Everything is working for our benefit. This is what Paul is saying. And who is he saying to? The Corinthian church. For all things are for your sake, Corinthian church. Wow, man, Corinthian had so many problems. This church was filled with problems. You name the problem and that's possible there. And it was there in the Corinth church. And he's saying, but the things that Paul is going through is because... It's for the benefit of the Corinthian church. Why? So that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. That's why Paul faithfully endured and faithfully served. Because he knew that the benefit would go to a large group of people. Especially the believers in the Corinthian church. All things are for your sakes. All things Sometimes we can, people can think that God is with us at the mountain tops but not in the valleys. No. God is with us in the valleys too and that is Psalms 23. And this is God's plan. Never forget the sovereignty of God. He's sovereign. He knows. There is a man in the Bible called Joseph and there is his life. He's sold He's betrayed by his brothers, sold to the slaves, falsely accused, cast into the prison. And he can look at, say, affliction, terrible, but all things are for his sake. Romans 8.28 was happening in his life. But later, when it went clear, God brought all to pass. And what was Joseph's testimony? Genesis 50 verse 20. You planned it for evil, but God meant it for good. What was the abounding grace that Israel would come in as 70 people to Egypt, almost finished off as a nation in the worst famine of the earth? 
And in Exodus, when they went out, there were two million. <laughs> Abundant grace from 70 in the worst famine, it goes where? To two million people. And that's the abundant grace. And who gets the glory? God gets. And there was an abundant grace that when we face the valleys, God's name is glorified and praised. Why? Because we begin to reveal the life of Christ in us. Like don't waste the things and the circumstances and the situations that happen in your life and think of them that another one has passed by. Look for a way to glorify God and praise God in it. And remember, God has sufficient grace for you. And whenever we acknowledge the fact that His grace is sufficient for me, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it will always lead to thanksgiving and bring glory to God. 1 Peter 4, 10 talks about it. We have the manifold grace of God, which means whatever comes at life, there is a specific grace to handle that. Situation, affliction, circumstances, problem, temptation, whatever, there is a specific grace that God gives to the believer so that he can handle it. What's the purpose of that? Not that we would endure it and say, ha, no, but so that the light would shine out of our lives. Remember, Israel in the wilderness would receive manna every day. Same with you and me. We receive grace every day for the situations and things and that happen to us every day. Whatever you and I need for today, God gives us a sufficient and abundant grace to handle it. Grace for tomorrow will have to wait till tomorrow. You will not get tomorrow's grace today. Today, you will get sufficient grace to handle whatever you go through. Tomorrow's grace, you will get tomorrow. Next week, what happens in your life? There will be sufficient grace next to be given to you. It's like the manna. Next month, what you go through in your life? God will give you sufficient grace for the next month. Next year's grace will be given next year. You will receive it when it's time. You can't get those things in advance. Little by little, God will reveal it to you. Remember this. It will always be abundant and it will always cause you to give thanksgiving and bring glory to God. That's the purpose. That's the purpose. <laughs> In verse 16 he says, Therefore we do not lose heart, we don't faint. Though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. What is Paul saying we don't lose heart? It means we don't get discouraged. Why? Because we are jars of clay. And it is easy for a jar of clay to feel the pressure and begin to reveal cracks. But he's saying because we have the treasure in us, we reveal the Lord. We reveal his purpose. We reveal his plan. And we have a smile on our face. It's not wasted. Everything that God gives us and allows us to go through is never a waste. It's never a waste. So don't waste opportunities. Don't waste those moments. Don't waste these days. Don't waste them. These are opportunities given to you so that no matter your outward physical body is growing old, weak, but your inward man is being renewed day by day. Outwardly, you are getting old. If you don't feel it, wait for a little while, you will. <laughs> but you're inwardly, you're getting younger, you're getting more mature, more fit. Why? Because one day you will be presented before the Lord. And it's not in vain, it's not in waste. Because why are we strengthened on the inner man? Because that's where the treasure is. That's where the treasure is. And, you know, God does not allow anything to come into our life without a plan and purpose. But with the plan and purpose also comes the power of God. <clears throat> Outer man is decaying, but our inner man is being renewed day by day. We are being made fit for heaven. Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 25, As your days 
Deuteronomy 33:25 As your days so shall your strength be You will be growing weaker but spiritually you are growing stronger That's our purpose we cannot be growing spirit, physically older and getting weaker spiritually that's not the way to live if that is happening in your life then you are you are not, something is not right because as we are growing older physically our inward spiritual life should be growing stronger It has to be that's the way only then will the treasure be revealed Isaiah 40 verse 13 God renews your strength he says in verse 16 you right it's being renewed what is renewed your strength day by day god renews it god renews it verse 17 for the momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison i love this verse momentary light affliction producing for us eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison <laughs> momentary really is it really momentary it's been going on for years you don't know how do you don't know i am suffering for many years really all is saying it's momentary it's light compared to what eternal weight of glory if you take a scale and on one side you put all your troubles all your afflictions all your trials and then on the other side you put the glory eternal weight of the glory far beyond all comparison the weight of it he is saying listen from eternity's perspective this is moment gone what you will receive in heaven gone that's what your fixed the like it's moment god will accomplish in us far more glory than the afflictions we face here these afflictions are light light compared to what light compared to what jesus suffered for us on the earth light compared to what the other saints suffered light compared to what we really deserve but by his grace and mercy he did not allow that to happen when you look at affliction is saying focus on eternity in negative situations will have a positive outcome when we trust in our god negative situations will have a positive outcome when we trust in our god that is what will bring in the eternal weight of glory sodium and chlorine we can't take them but when you combine them it becomes salt oxygen and hydrogen oxygen is flammable hydrogen burns in that sense we can't take it in its pure form but put them together and you get water and what that's what it is that is seemingly negative but where there is obedience and trust in the light of eternity all says it's far greater than what is going on 5 minutes into heaven Five minutes into heaven, you will not remember anything what you went through on the earth. It is going to be magnificent, and the presence of God in heaven will reveal it, and we will be like so overawed at the presence of Christ that we will forget all the tears, all that which happened on the earth to us. Five minutes. some of our family members are already there and he grew zeal and remember he said the great cloud of witnesses they are saying go on go on yeah you have jars of clay but you have no idea the glory you have no idea what is happening to us here in heaven keep going on compared to what happened on the earth it's amazing here that's what is bringing into focus Paul is bringing it into focus in the midst of it. He says, "Keep trusting God, keep obeying God. That's how you will reveal His glory." 
and by the way <clears throat> if the trials begin to get too heavy and you're losing your joy check if you're trusting in obeying him god did not design the trial or the affliction to become a burden upon you he said my yoke is easy my burden is light matthew 11:28 to 30 But if it is becoming heavy, check, check. Are you trusting and obeying Him? Because when we are not, then these things seem to be heavy. Then it seems to be heavy. Focus on the promises of God. Think about the promises of God. Not only does He know what you are going through, He knows for how long it will be. it's not just you know that you will continue doing this all through eternity that's not the idea that's not what he's saying in verse 18 he says while we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal he's trying to focus us on hebrews 11 <laughs> he's saying go back to that point because if you focus on the things that are seen on the temporary then you will not be able to focus on the eternal you know israel lost the plot israel began to miss it and they they really missed the whole point because they began to focus on the temporal and god said to them in malachi you have robbed me and you are losing your status as a nation in that sense you are going into captivity and then all these things are happening to you and they are like but when did we rob you he says in the tithes and the offerings but that's like as a nation we would lose our status because we are in a sense we are going through all this because we robbed you in the offering yeah you bought me you bought me i asked you for lambs and i asked you for offerings without a blemish and you brought me the ones that were left over you robbed me what was the point that god was making he saying it always started in significant things small little things you stopped being faithful in the small things in life and that's why you began to focus on the temporal and not the eternal and that's why you don't have joy that's why you miss out and you think the burdens is too much and god is against you says why because you are not faithful in the small things imagine they began to rob god of his tithes and they ended up losing in a sense and going into captivity as a nation sin always begins small but it spreads and that's why it's compared to leprosy which starts like a small dot on this finger but then it spreads and it says this is how we are if we live looking and believing in the seen then we will never look and focus on the unseen and there are three enemies and i want to in closing i want to talk about this that there are three enemies of our faith the first one of the enemies of our of our faith is what we see and that's appearance and he's saying here we look not at the things which are seen what's the obvious thing that's going on we don't look at it we look at the unseen what is god doing behind the scenes faith comes how by hearing the word of god but this is the enemy of our faith in hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 it says faith is the substance of things hoped for evidence of things not seen something that i have not seen it i don't have enough evidence but i have in the sense but i it it brings joy even though i don't see it that's what paul is saying here here's a good example as kids when we <laughs> mistakes or did you know rude behavior whatever then we knew that there is going to be a spanking so we had an anticipation oh i am going to be punished now but that anticipation never brought joy we were not like ah, i'm going to be punished now no there was no end. it was you know like oops there we go now there is going to be Mm-mm. here comes the ruler in the christian life the anticipation is joy when we are focusing on the things seen we are saying god is a tough task master when we are focusing on what that is not seen then we have joy because we have faith and the enemy of the unseen because we live by that for the unseen 
The enemy of the unseen is the appearance, what we see. We want the human nature is like this. I want to see, I want to feel, I want to touch, I want to experience it before I really believe it. And God is saying you got to believe before you even see it. And that's the that's our enemy. That's the enemy that we want. Remember, Thomas would do that. Only when I see, then I will believe. <laughs> well, congratulations. <laughs> Doubting Thomas, and we are that way sometimes. Appearances, appearances. But Peter would write in First Peter one and two, whom having not seen we love, and whom though we don't see him yet we believe and rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Have you seen Jesus? No, I have not seen Jesus, but I love him. I believe in him. That's what Paul is trying to tell us. Things which are seen, we do not look at them. What's the second enemy? Our emotions, what we feel. We are very prone to go by our emotions. The flesh always moves towards the emotions. And remember, God does not do his deepest work in our emotions. He does his deepest work in our spirit. That's where the human spirit and God's spirit meet. God does his deepest work in our spirit, not in our emotions. Here is a good example. Have you got up some days and you know, uh, and you don't feel like praying, and you don't feel like you saying it's too dark and it's rainy and I feel sleepy and oh I have a headache or and then you go and you know, you know, you have a cup of tea and and then suddenly you feel like praying and then you like you have a great time in devotion and you say, Wow, I got up. And, you know, I was not feeling okay at all, but then I had the tea and then you know, I had a great time with the Lord. What are you saying? The power was in the tea. And sometimes you say, yeah, the power was in the tea. I took the tea and I feel refreshed. No, that's emotions. The power was when you went to God and you say, I, in the name of Jesus, I'm coming and I'm reading the scriptures and praying. God's power began to work. God's power began to work. The tea was not the catalyst. The power of God was. And that's why we don't live by what we feel. Those who live by what they feel, it's like taking a chance. And you know what happens when you take a chance with God? You are always wrong. You are never 50-50. You are always wrong. Because God has never called us to live by our emotions. He's called us to live by faith. The third enemy of the unseen is what we think, logic, reasoning. I'm not saying we should not have logic and we should not be reasonable. But when we are talking spiritual, we don't go by things that are how they seem to be or how we feel or what our natural senses say. We go by what God says. We go by what God says. <clears throat> Remember in John 6, what did the disciples say to Jesus? How will we feed so many? Natural thinking, logic, reason. We don't have the funds. It will take one year's salary to feed them. Right. So what do we do? Send them away. But God's greatest miracle was in a sense going to take place right there. Because we live by the unseen. Jesus said, bring whatever you have. And I will take it. And maybe 20,000 people will eat. What happened? Christ knew the principle and this is our life. Maybe what we have to offer today to Christ is just these few loaves of bread and two fish. And we say bring it to him and he will multiply it. And this jar, this jar of clay will reveal Jesus Christ. That jar of clay will reveal Jesus Christ. We, th we What does he say? But at the things which are not seen, Things which are seen are temporal, but things which are not seen are eternal. What do you prefer to remember today? What will you prefer to remember? The Philip's argument of saying how many people are there, how much money will we need, and we will not feed them, so let's send them away. Or you remember Jesus saying, bring them to me and everyone got. We remember what Jesus did. Why? The things which are not seen are eternal. Your faith, when you live by it, is eternal. When you live for Christ, it's eternal. Remember what we said in the beginning. That our lives have a purpose. Our lives have a purpose. Live. Because what we, you must plan for victory. 
No matter what comes, you must plan for victory. God will bring this victory. Why? Because we are living for that which is not seen and eternal and it is adding weight of glory there. We live for that. Power will come from Christ. Grace will come from Christ. Be encouraged, be strengthened. No matter how deep the valley it is, <laughs> Christ is always there. How hot the furnace may be, the fourth man is walking in the fire. How, how many lions may be there in the, in the den, the presence of God is there. The enemies have surrounded me, but look up and you will see the armies of heaven have taken over. But I am weak, but Gideon, your 300 men are greater than a lad, 30,000 Midianites. Who well, have nothing but five loaves and two fish is enough. And what about this one? And what is it to you? You follow me. You follow me. This is Paul encouraging and strengthening us as believers. And I hope that these messages in a sense bring the same spirit to you. That this is our life. Jars of clay. But the treasure is revealed. And the eternal weight of glory. We cannot compare with it. We cannot compare with it. One day when we are with him. With Jesus Christ. In heaven. Then we will say, wow, all worth it. It was all worth it. Living by faith, it was worth it. It didn't seem like that on the earth. But it was all worth it. All worth it. Our lives have a purpose. The church exists for those who are not its members. And no matter what we go through, there is abundant grace for today. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning that there is great grace, there is great treasure, there is an abundance of life for each one of us. We love you, worship you, give you all the glory and honor. Thank you. Help us to live for the unseen and not for the seen, for the eternal and not for the temporary. We love you, Lord. And for those who have not trusted Christ as their Savior, this is a great opportunity. Put your trust in Christ. Accept Him as your Lord and Savior. You are sure of eternal life. Everything happens on the earth is for a purpose. One, if you do not know Christ, it's to draw you close to God. And two, so that you would accept Him as Lord and Savior and be assured of heaven, sins being forgiven. If you want to be sure of going to heaven, say the simple prayer in your heart. Say, Jesus, save me. Thank you for dying for my sins. I put my trust in you. I believe that you came on this earth, on the cross, you died for all my sins, you were buried, you rose again in three days, today you are alive, come into my life and save me, I want to be a child of God, God hears your prayers, and to the believers hears what we are saying, and what the verse is saying, all things are for your sake, all things are for your sake, and we live not for the temporal, but for the eternal, and through our jars of clay, is revealed the glory of God. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the message that we heard once again this morning. And uh, as we start a brand new week, Lord, we pray that your every word that we've heard, Lord Jesus, would resound in our hearts. Church, let's once again proclaim that the battle belongs to the Lord. Amen.
for what we heard this morning and we pray that as we step out into our friends and families father god we pray that we would we would testify to our families and friends that have not been saved that we may gloriously talk about you lord jesus in boldness and confidence god of what we've heard this morning lord god you are our strength you are our fortress once again lord jesus we pray for your fiery hedge of protection around the church the family members and the church members and the extended members lord god continue father god to protect each and every one of them and bless the works of their hands and give us a wonderful week ahead in this situation god for you are our strength in jesus name we pray